Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Omnia Performance Podcast. I am 50% of your regular hosting team, Fergus Crawley. Johnny is unfortunately unavailable today, but in his stead, we have the handsome and wonderfully wise Dr. Phil Price. Say hello to your fans, Phil. Hello, fans. <laughs> no, I thought that sounded like only fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did. There's, that is where my head went at that point, I must admit, but I did set you up for that. So nonetheless, today we are going to go through the 10 mistakes that we believe are most commonly made or that we've even made in the past when it comes to hybrid training, whether that's putting a program together, whether it's planning your goals, whether it's approaching your structure. We're going to go through it all. We're going to go through the 10 things that come up on a most regular basis so that you can learn from our mistakes, other people's mistakes, and hopefully not make them yourself or reflect with a smile on your face on a previous version of yourself. But before we dive into those 10 things, usual podcast stuff, please rate or review on whatever platform you're listening on. We are also on YouTube, watch us there, share with a friend and yeah, just do all that stuff. Cheers. Thank you very much. And if you are interested in more education focused lectures, seminars, chat rooms, research database, all that good stuff, then head to the link down below in the show notes where you can join Omnia Performance Premium, which is our online coaching education portal. So you have myself and Johnny covering all things programming focus, practicality, logistics, the actual coaching implications from a human to human point of view of hybrid training. And then you've got Phil in the background, reinforcing the methodology, giving us all the data, science, information, and ultimately credibility that underpins everything that we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're interested in that as a coach, as an individual, as a budding sports science academic, then you know where to go. So let's cover the 10 biggest mistakes that we come across or have made in the realm of hybrid training, starting with me. So hmm. I use this example all the time. YouTube videos, consultation calls, talks on the street, I say it in the mirror, I write it in my journal, it's in my diary, I say it to the pig dog, Erin's bored of me saying it, but the biggest mistake that people make is taking 100% of a strength training program, 100% of a running or triathlon program, and putting them together. What does that equal? That equals 200%. What are we capable of as human beings? 100%. As both programs were designed with the intent of being done in their individuality, so when you splice them together, you are essentially overstepping what you are logically going to be able to recover from unless you're a genetic anomaly and that means that traditionally people have essentially done too much too soon not being able to make any progress being overcome with fatigue and therefore after four to six to eight weeks feel run down feel worn out feel like they're going backwards and go oh well this hybrid training stuff doesn't work i'm going to go back to my running i'm going to go back to my strength work so that's why we at omnia performance are so proud to provide the programs that sit in the middle the training plans that sit in the middle and the individual one-to-one -one stuff that helps people basically uncover the best versions of themselves in this space but you are not going to make the progress that you are most capable of in a hybrid setting by taking Wendler's 531 and couch to 5k for example or taking that Ironman beginners program off the internet and then doing strong list 5 by 5 because you are putting too much together that you haven't yet built up towards you haven't got the foundations for each especially if one of those disciplines is new and you're essentially nullifying the validity of each individual program because those programs were designed without the other disciplines in mind. So that's point number one. Don't put two training programs in different disciplines together and expect that to be the result that's going to get you to the end goal because that is not accounting for the demand of the two disciplines sitting alongside one another. Okay, very staccato <laughs> finish to my point. We will move on to point number two, please, Phil. Go for it. Throw, I know we wrote them down earlier so throw one my we did way. so sorry i should give you point number two so point number two is people's ambition and aiming for perfection rather than progress yes i actually made a post about this today um because everyone well talks found. about the term consistency is king which i i kind of agree you know if you want to progress you know in any type of domain, whether it be sporting, anything skill-based, academic, writing, whatever it be, music, you know, you need to develop consistency because that gives you time to practice and it's that volume of practice over a long period of time which you suddenly get better. I'm sure everyone's learnt a skill where they feel like they're not really progressing that much then all of a sudden things just click. They gave themselves time and they have developed that skill just by going through practice, whether that's deliberate, random, block practice, whatever it might be. 
Um, <clears throat> and I, what I see many mistakes that people make is they go or try to make their training program, especially for hybrid training, because you're trying to you know balance two very opposing styles of training. Uh, they try to make it very perfect they're trying to optimize their training which is admirable you know you're utilizing scientific literature conversations with the athlete uh, experiences to try and create this perfect program for this athlete but quite often people don't take into account the indirect things the work family life all of those types of things so all of a sudden you've got this optimal program and i say that with inverted commas but they can't do it they can't be consistent so if they can't be consistent, they're not going to progress slowly because they're not, you know, consistently training over time. So all of a sudden, this optimal program clearly isn't optimal because they can't regularly do it. So quite often, you'll write a program and start making some changes based on the athlete, which may come across as like, oh, the scientific literature might not necessarily agree with that. You're like, well, okay, that's fine because... In this situation, taking into account his training and this person's personal life, this is probably the best option. So quite often, I think for everyone, every program is going to be suboptimal to some level or some degree. And I think that's fine. It's finding what level of suboptimal is appropriate for that particular athlete, which is going to make them remain consistent because that is the key. Consistency is king. Exactly. 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 So just to be the very concise here, point number two is aim for progress, not perfection. Yeah. And just to add to your point about people trying to make the perfect pro program and then realizing it might not be correct. Essentially, the bigger problem here is constantly going through that cycle where you second guess yourself after three weeks, after four weeks and go back to the drawing board. Because then not only are you chasing perfection, which doesn't actually exist for reference, you are not even committing to plan A in the first place and you're just sort of going back to the drawing board over and over again and essentially treading water. In my mind, it's better com to commit to 12 months of progress than it is to constantly repeat the same pattern of aiming for perfection because it doesn't exist and you may well stay in the same mm. place. So point number three is not accounting for muscle mass when it comes to being a hybrid athlete. So if you're coming to running, if you're coming to triathlon, if you're coming to cycling from a gym background, there is loads of information online from Runner's World forums on Slow Twitch about how you can approach open water swimming, how you can approach running, all the kit that's required, X, Y, Z. But if you're a bit bigger than the average runner, the average triathlete, you're, you're shaped in different ways, there's going to be a few practical considerations, like chamois cream is going to become even more essential than it might already be said to be on the Tour de France. But you are going to chafe in places that runners might not. You are going to chafe in places that triathletes might not. And that is just an implication of being slightly larger and potentially more jacked than the guy next to you at the start line of your first marathon. So don't be ignorant to them. Obviously, take advice from runners and triathletes on practical things, but also appreciate that you're built slightly differently. So make sure you can find kit that fits you, that works right for you. Under shorts or, or inner linings on shorts are a really big win for a lot of our athletes. It's a, I, I choose that as an example because it's a common conversation I have chamois cream and anti-friction cream is your friend wetsuits you might need to find a brand that that works better for you who have some fantastic options in terms of they've got a short and stocky version and things like that which is great cycling kit it's tough to find again i get everything from who but it's taken me a few iterations to find one that works your seat position if you go for a bike fit your general tension in your upper back and your triceps where you can put force through is going to be different to that of a regular triathlete which might be a challenge for your bike fitter to overcome but these are all things that are there to consider. So don't be ignorant to them. Obviously take advice from runners and triathletes because they're great at what they do. But also acknowledge that if you're coming from a gym background and you're a bit larger, your tolerance for volume might be a bit lower. You shouldn't work off the weekly mileage that Gavin on the internet says you should. Your shorts might fit a bit differently. The Salomon pack that the guy that lives in the Lake District that weighs 58 kilos says is the best trail pack on the market might not be able to get around your big beefy lats and these are all things that you need to bear in mind as a hybrid athlete you are coming at it from a different angle so celebrate that but also be open-minded to the fact that you might have a few obstacles that you need to overcome but just be willing to overcome them with an open mind essentially so that's point number three which is not accounting for the variety of body shapes that come from a gym background into an endurance one 
So point number four, Phil, is using music. Yes. Def, I love using music when doing my endurance work. Whether that's a good thing or not, um, you know, I just really enjoy it because I feel it's like my time on my own and it allows me to think. Uh, and if I'm listening to a podcast, for example, I can start to get more ideas uh, and start to think in those right, those ways. That and driving the car is just like my own time in my head where I can develop ideas. However, what I have found is that if I utilize using music, I have a tendency to do my zone two type runs just that little bit fast. Now, my the long-term implications of that could be that I start to, I don't know, increase, start to compound fatigue that could lead to problems, potentially lead to injury, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I've noticed, and this can be tied back into the, your previous point, Fergus, regarding heavier athletes, if I'm doing a longer run, say I've got 18K, it's my weekend run, uh, and quite often, to get me in the mood, I'll put some music on, and I will run at a certain pace based on how I feel, probably use an RPE. And because I'm utilizing music, that RPE probably feels pretty good for a certain pace. I'll get, usually I, I've, on the island that I live on, I'll go down the side and up on something called the Billy Trail. I'll reach the end. And then by that time, I've probably thought, oh, actually, I need to listen to this podcast, which I've been having on the back burner for a while. I'll put the podcast on and all of a sudden the run feels completely different. I feel so much heavier. Uh, and yes, because I've just, you know, done half the run, I've done 9K, I'm 94KG and not a great runner. Uh, but then all of a sudden, I've changed the type of stimulus that's coming into me based on just what I'm listening to. And everything feels harder. And it's probably because because I used music prior to that, I've gone a little bit too fast. And then everything just feels worse than the second bit. So I've got a run which isn't consistent. You know, there's two halves to it. My heart rate's different. My pace is different. And... I don't think that is necessarily beneficial. So I now, if I'm doing a long run, I try and make sure that I am just listening to something that is a podcast or an audio book to avoid that particular issue. I'll leave the music to the interval work. To distill it down, it's essentially be selective with your music usage. Don't become dependent or reliant upon it and make informed decisions about when to use it and when not to use it because that will set you up for success even more. Mm. And just think of the knowledge Excellent. gains. Okay. Listen to the Omni exactly. Performance yeah, podcast yeah, on your long runs. Good plug. Good plug, Phil. Yeah. Love your work. Get, Love yeah. your work. I'm so number that. five is not accounting for additional energy expenditure. So if you are moving more through aerobic work, you're going to be using more calories. I think bodybuilding, powerlifting, gym settings in general have the best understanding of nutrition out of any sports on the planet. There are some still hilariously backwards bro sciencey things that I hear coming out of professional sporting organizations. I'm sure you, I know it's out with your remit, Phil, but I'm sure there's still some things from an S&C background that you'll hear and go, oh no. Hmm. But the, the, understanding of nutrition, macros, micros, how to put things together, body composition is very, very good in a gym setting, generally speaking. But there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect when it comes to adding in some endurance volume that that additional volume is going to massively increase your energy expenditure throughout the week on a daily basis. So you need to make sure to eat that back. And that doesn't encourage seeing food as a reward or anything like that, because I know that's a bit of a slippery slope and a separate argument entirely. But you need to balance the books. I don't want to encourage non-accountants to view themselves as accountants but please do when it comes to balancing your your energy because if you're going to be adding on new movement patterns new skills new demands biomechanically physically you're going to want to recover from those and the best way to do that is to nail your sleep to nail your programming and to nail your food intake so just be conscious of the fact that your energy expenditure is going to go up as you increase endurance volume when you move into a hybrid training style and you're, if you've known for years, oh, my maintenance calories are around 2,800 to 3,000 calories. That's just who I am at my body weight. I'm, I'm just sitting at maintenance most of the year. That's probably going to go up. So just be aware of that and bear that in mind because you could inadvertently put yourself into a massive deficit and therefore inhibit your recovery and therefore end up back like the person in point number one who after four to six to eight weeks says, oh, no, no this hybrid training stuff doesn't work. I'm just going to go back to what I was doing in the first place. So point number five is not accounting for additional energy expenditure and passing the baton over to Phil. Point number six is worrying too much about the interference effect. Yes, I would say that, God, I could really go into a lot of depth here. 
uh, and probably have on the Omnia Performance Premium over several uh, several lectures. Um, but I, I'd say for most of us, or most of those getting into hybrid sports, that the interference effect probably won't have as much as effect as we think it will do. Say you're only training an hour a day. As long as you're not being stupid and going 100% on all of them, the fact that you're combining strength and endurance work probably won't have a an effect from the, like a molecular standpoint. Uh, for example, yes, it could be from like a, an accumulation of fatigue, but that's the same with any program. Uh, and if your progress is slower, it's probably because you're doing uh, less total work in one domain. So, for example, if you've got uh, a powerlifter who is uh, strength training six times a week, then you've got a hybrid trainer who is doing three sessions of strength and three endurance sessions. You know, he's technically doing half the amount of strength training as the strength only group. Of course, they're going to progress slower. So, what's the point of comparing them? They're different. Um, and because of most people that are getting into, you know, hybrid training, they've got other things that that take up their lives. They've got jobs, they've got families. And, you know, so they can only give a certain amount of time. So for these people, you know, the interference effect probably wouldn't be a, that much of a of an issue. And it might be reflected in the research because a lot of uh, intervention studies which have used novice, novice recreationally trained athletes, not really much of a difference. Um, it's when you get into that trained area where it becomes more of an issue. If you're training multiple times a day, you're in that elite status, that's when the interference effect could be an issue. But if you are manipulating your certain training variables and training appropriately in terms of the whole week, the whole year, uh, there are things that, which are there to try and minimize that as, as possible. So... Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's going to be some form of interference effect because, yeah, you know, you don't have Andy Bolton running a three-hour marathon, something like that. There is some level at the elite end, but for most of us, it's going to be negligible. And again, to add to your plug, there are two lectures live on Omni Performance Premium breaking down exactly that topic as it's hotly debated within the hybrid training space. And we have done a podcast previously on exactly that. So plenty of resources for you to tap into. And I very much hope that you do. So number seven is people, not people, athletes, not tracking data. Again, gym background, lots of positive reinforcement over the years of how important it is to track progression, progressive overload, bring a notepad, strength shop used to sell weight tracking booklets that I had loads of back in the day, et cetera, et cetera. And again, something that as a whole, the fitness industry is fantastic at. But when making the switch over to running, to cycling, to swimming, that is almost ignored a little bit when actually it's a very, very useful tool, especially at a beginner level. I mean, especially at an advanced level, but from the off, understanding how certain what parameters feel or better understanding your heart rate means that your training can be more effective from the off. And you can actually avoid making a lot of the mistakes that people make initially, which is going too hard too soon. In the pool, trying to swim 25 meters as hard as you can and feeling like you're about to drown might make you think, oh, there's no way I can do this swimming thing oh, this triathlon was a bad idea, you know what, I'm just going to give it up and go back to doing X, Y, and Z. When in reality, actually, just really slowing down your stroke and understanding that, okay, well, if I do a two-minute per 100-meter pace rather than a 145-minute per 100 pace, I can actually breathe effectively and I don't panic as much and therefore I can build from here. Running, doing a lactate heart rate threshold test, working off math, working off 220 minus age, even though I very rarely recommend that, Essentially, it gives you an opportunity to work within specific parameters and make your training more effective from the off. And actually, you'll probably be surprised at how effective you can be with your training when moving into a new discipline by staying in zone two. But the only way you're going to know that you're in zone two is by tracking the data from the off. Cycling, wattage is an entirely new metric for most people. C2 bikes give you it. What bikes give you it? If you're new to hybrid training, you're probably not going to have a power meter or a smart turbo. So in a gym setting, what bikes and C2 bikes will have it, and it's something you should monitor. So an FTP test might be something worth doing if you're a sadist, because they're terrible, and that would be a really, really bad way to introduce yourself to this. But nonetheless, understanding your what parameters, what feels like zone two, what feels like zone three, four, five, etc., is a good thing to do. And I mean, I can be, I can list off a whole load of metrics here, but essentially understand, commit the time to understand the data required in the sport that you are trying, 
try and understand it to the best of your ability from the off and then work within specific parameters so that you're essentially getting the most bang for your buck with your training. Therefore, you can keep your volume higher from a weightlifting point of view without doing lots of arbitrary fluff volume in the pool or on your feet that's actually doing nothing but accumulating fatigue rather than pushing you forwards. So point number seven is not tracking data across the board rather than just in the weight room. And that leads us into point number eight, which is planned progress over randomization, Phil. So I think this is specifically talking about functional fitness, CrossFit background, where randomization has become quite popular and exciting. But at the end of the day, planned progress is superior when it comes to specific goals. Am I right? Very, very right. Um, I, I don't want this as an opportunity to not CrossFit. I think CrossFit's a great sport, and I think there's some great coaches out there. Uh, the Red Pill guys, for an example. But uh, if you actually look at what they're doing, everything they're doing is very, very structured, and they're using like strength and conditioning techniques to you know, go from what is required from the sport and breaking that down and then trying to develop those qualities uh, and lead them back to the sport. And you need to have some kind of plan to see how the athlete's progressing in that direction. Now, what I think has happened in some CrossFit uh, communities, uh, you get the odd CrossFit coach where they will just throw as much training as possible at the athlete. And then if the athlete is one of those genetic freaks who is able to tolerate all of that volume of work, that random volume of work, then they improve because they've just been had a load of training that they did but for most people that doesn't work uh you need to have some form of progress like say if you did i don't know you know the crossfit uh, workouts with a name like fran and stuff like that like they should be at least some form of benchmark which you can progress or do some derivatives of that to try and see how you progress if you're just doing random stuff each time how do you know if you're progressing how do you know if like um a four minute fran versus a four minute fran eight weeks down the line is any better should it feel better should you do it you know, you know all of those types of things um and I, I i see it a lot um in terms of there just seems to be no progression and then all of a sudden the coach will change their mind and then they'll have like a session where it's like oh this is a really hard session i'm going to you know change it last minute because you never know what might happen in a crossfit event because you know they quite a lot of the times the events they're trying to make it so the athlete doesn't know and they've got to think about tactics on the fly which is a skill which it needs to be developed but i've seen some random changes in 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 sessions which to me looks dangerous it almost to the point where the 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 athletes like oh they suddenly got me doing this this really hard workout and i was like fucked for three days and i was like oh, okay so that ruined three days worth of training to be honest because you were so fatigued um you know there's no point doing that at the expense of all the other training that you're doing so um yeah you'll find that even i listen to a podcast with the jst compete guys like they'll here's a here's a workout and they know exactly why they've done five rounds instead of three why they've got that exercise followed by that one you know, it's very, very structured. They're working on specific things, whether it would be physical qualities or tactics. And But there are a lot of coaches out there which are just, you know, oh, they're just putting random stuff together. And some people improve at the beginning because they're quite new to it. So any type of stimulus allows them to improve. But if you really want to progress it even further, there needs to be some kind of structure there. Yeah, just to add, I think that's most relevant to a box setting and encouraging people not to get drawn into the ooh, shininess of, oh, it's always fun, I'm always doing something different. If that's what you enjoy, then great, but don't then fall under the illusion that that is essentially moving you towards more specific goals or improving you in certain ways. If you're just hammering yourself with Metcons and getting sweaty five days a week, you're probably only really becoming more efficient at getting sweaty and hammering Metcons which isn't a criticism of people that want to do that because that's absolutely fine. But don't then be surprised if your 5K time hasn't improved or if your top end strength maybe hasn't improved because you're under so much fatigue. So essentially, planned progress structure is significantly superior to randomization when it comes to actually making progress towards goals. Mm -hmm. So if you have goals, then mm -hmm. don't make the mistake of wanting to do the shiny new thing all the time. You need to commit the time to doing the 
good old fashioned honest work mm. and that well, variability is, is not happens. an excuse to do a load of random stuff Agreed. variability still Agreed. needs to be planned Great, great example of the middle ground that we're referring to here is West Side, for example. So heavy lower, heavy upper, lower speed, upper speed, variations on your main squat, bench, deadlift movement. And whilst, yeah, you can really go a bit mental with West Side, well, I'm going to do this in a pair of briefs to an eight inch box with my chains on and then have reverse band assistance and, and then do a backflip afterwards. Essentially, it's variations on the main movement to work on weak point training whilst essentially giving some element of variability and randomization within the context of the training. But it's randomization within a certain structure rather than just, as you said, chuck shit at the wall and hope for the best. So anyway, rabbit hole, we'll, we'll retract, we'll retract. So point number nine is trying to do it all. The amount of conversations, emails, DMs that we receive where it says, hello, I am Antonio Banderas. Apparently, why did that name? Puss in boots. Is he? Is he? Puss, is he puss in boots? <laughs> yeah, I think that, it is. Is yeah. Antonio Banderas and Zorro? In boots? Is that right? He's Zorro and puss I think he's Zorro. Yeah. It, uh, essentially, I I saw the, the what thumbnail on Netflix yesterday for pu- puss in boots too, and I thought, ah, haha. so Antonio Banderas has come to my head. He has not actually sent us a DM or an email for training, but I'm going to run with this because this could be interesting. And because he's so multifaceted as a kitten in a pair of boots, as well as being Zorro, he is a great example of someone trying to do it all. So. Point number nine is not being realistic about what can actually be achieved and trying to do it all. So we've had several, hundreds actually, emails from mostly men. Sorry, lads. I understand why we're like this, but we are like this. It, it, it's seeing the shiny thing, seeing the exciting thing and wanting to do it. So oh, I'm going to train for my first Ironman, but I want to do BJJ. It's often BJJ is always the one in there that really takes it over the edge, actually, which is just the thought that's come to me now. Wow, this is convoluted. Fergus, stay on track. So... We've had a lot of people that come to us with, I want to do BJJ five times a week, but I'm training for my first Ironman, but I want to also train for a 220 deadlift, whereas my current max is 190. Oh, by the way, I'm also training to be a firearms police officer. I need to do these tests in February in three months. And there does come a point where we need to say, well, okay, you could maybe crawl over the finish line. You could maybe get through those BJJ sessions. You'd probably get choked out a lot. Your deadlift would probably go up if you devote a lot of strength to that. But how convincingly would you get through the firearms police testing? We don't know. Because essentially there's too much going on there. And you would only be able to do a minimum dose of each individual component when you add it all together that might not actually be adapting you towards those goals. And that just comes down to the fact there's too many things going on. So... I'm not going to put a number on how many things one person can train for at the same time because obviously training for a Olympic weightlifting versus skateboarding is a very different thing. So you need to be realistic and understand what's achievable. There is no coaching company out there that's going to solve that problem for you because it's it's simply an equation that cannot be resolved to output progress. If you are doing too much, you are not going to be able to recover. You're not going to be able to adapt. So you need to understand what allocation you can give to each discipline to move it forwards, or are you willing to take the hit where you actually just maintain the skill but maybe lose a bit of actual ability. But that's where it can become a difficulty because the ego takes a bit of a hit and you might then oh, I'll find somebody else to give the solution or oh, I've been looking for years to find find a way to be able to do all these things when the answer might be staring you in the face that actually you can't do all these things. But what you can do is maybe take two of them, focus on them for six months and actually in the background do one BJJ session a week so that you actually keep the skill, you keep the movement, you keep showing up, you keep working towards your grading. But you might need to actually set a date quite clearly in the future where you're going to do the firearms police officer testing because you can't just turn up for it ready when you're under six weeks of doing 27 sessions a week of fatigue. So be realistic is essentially the point here. We specialize in solving this equation for people when they're trying to progress things at at the same time, but we'll hold our hands up and say that there's some things, there is a limit. There is a limit to what the human body can tolerate. And we occasionally get emails and questions and DMs from people that would like to somehow go beyond what one can tolerate. And that's where we'll need to put our hands up and say, you need to be realistic and prioritize and refine your goals rather than expect somebody else to solve that problem for you. So ask what's important to you. Look at why you're doing the certain things that you're doing and you're going to need to compromise. The essence of life, isn't it? Compromise. So there we are. I hope that point has been made clearly whilst I did somehow start talking about Antonio Banderas quite quickly. We're back. So Mm. Phil, bring us home. Number 10 is goal consistency. Yeah, so I have 
just written this part of the chapter in a book that I am currently putting together uh, and I reference Fergus in it because I think Fergus you're a very good example of this uh, so what happens a lot is that especially in hybrid training because we're in charge of our goals aren't we we're in charge of like oh I want to do weightlifting and ultra marathon you know we can pick them it's not like oh, I'm going to play rugby like you're doing rugby uh, and we could be because we can be creative with those goals we've got a bit more license to change our mind if we want to so people are always trying to like well I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and yes it's fine that's going to be some carryover if you're just working strength and aerobic work quite broadly but you need to spend time developing the skill of each of those domains like you know if you're going to be a runner you need to spend time running if you're going to be a rower you need to spend time rowing so moving back and forth uh, will limit your progress and why i think you're a really good example of this is that your hybrid goals are centered around powerlifting and triathlon and if you do a physical challenge like the six hour run or you know the com combination of a powerlifting uh, event and a marathon in the same day all of those types of things they are derivatives of your overall goal which is to be as strong as possible in powerlifting and to be as good at triathlon as possible so because of that your goals are consistent so you can build on them each time the, num the number of people and i've been uber guilty of this in the past they might think well i'm going to do a marathon row oh then i'm going to do uh, a triathlon then i'm going to do powerlifting meet you know it's, it's really chopped and changed around and if people are just consistent with their overall goals they'd be able to build on this each year, each year. Whereas people often try and go towards a physical challenge, they peak, then they regress back to where they started. Change direction, peak, change. So over time, they don't actually progress. They just progress very smallly. That's not even a word, smallly. Um, but uh, if you see what I mean, you know, um, every time you ask someone, what's your PB? Oh, it was like, uh, what's your PB in the bench? Oh, I got 160, you know, back in 2008 when I you know did west side for 12 weeks oh cool 2018 2008 like, you know it's always <laughs> something in the past it's like well yeah you got a peak but what happened I after that been, uh, i would have been a linebacker in the nfl had i not blown out my knee as the classic yeah. isn't it and it's just yeah I'm it's sure, always I'm sure you would steve <laughs> but it's, it's just people changing their goals constantly that's the reason why they haven't progressed year on year and whenever you ask what their pb was it was within the last year and so if you're consistent with your goals like yourself i think people can really achieve some great things in hybrid training so i uh, just just to add to this i'm very tactical and strategic about how i do this which is I, I plan ahead of time as you said which derivative of x y or z i'm going to translate the work done for a certain event into next so great example last year was we had the keltman into the outlaw where I got a really good season of triathlon under my belt whilst maintaining my strength work. In maintaining my strength work, it was then much easier to really prioritize strength work for a little while whilst removing the swimming and the biking element to prioritize running. But the adaptation, that isn't a word for sure, the adaptation towards being able to run 60K in under six hours alongside the strength work was much, much easier to, to move into because I had the base of a triathlon season under my belt where the aerobic adaptation, the intensity adaptation had come from the bike and the pool as well as the running. So therefore, to devote all that time to the running alongside the increase in weightlifting training meant that it wasn't actually that difficult transition. So essentially, I was moving myself one notch along the spectrum towards the other end rather than going to the complete other end. So if I'd said after keeping my strength up and then doing the Keltman, the outlaw, I'm going to do a CrossFit competition. Then that's moving to the complete other end of the spectrum because I hadn't been doing any handstand walks. I hadn't been doing an Olymp Olympic weightlifting whilst yes, I would have had some competency at redlining and having an aerobic base. I hadn't done the work essentially. So whilst yeah, it's a cool goal and it's all different and variable. All I'm doing, if, if you, the further along the other end of the spectrum you go from where you are currently, the longer the timeline needs to be. But me pivoting from me pivoting from the Keltman to the double brutal, for example, was essentially just removing the intensity for the most part and up in the volume. But had I said, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
commit to the double brutal in the same period of time without the Keltman under my belt, or having just done a powerlifting meet, then I would have been an idiot. And I would have been jumping too many too many rings along the ladder of the spectrum that we're referring to. So you can be tactical about this. You can plan it a long way. Ahead. So, right, let's paint a picture of this. Somebody, somebody with a general gym and sort of training background is doing high rocks in February. What's high rocks doing? High rocks is training you across a variety of things. It's lower skill dominant in the world of functional fitness, but there's a real running focus. So off the back of high rocks, maybe early summer, you could really focus. You could scale your strength work back, make it a bit more specific, and then actually train for your first marathon because you've got a lot of running, you've got a lot of running volume under your belt, and you're doing that running volume under fatigue. So take away the fatigue, and you can be a bit more specific about the running training. If you maintain the strength work alongside the marathon, you've ticked off the marathon box, and then you can go all back into the strength work whilst actually making use of that aerobic base a little bit more, which means you could maybe work in some higher volume strength endurance stuff, but make up for what you've maybe missed out on, which is the top end strength, really movement quality focused stuff. But you'll have this higher aerobic base as a result of it, which might mean that your tolerance in threshold can be raised even higher than it was previously. So we're moving into the winter and you can maybe go back to high rocks, but because you've devoted the time to running your marathon time, your tolerance for repeated volume at a certain threshold of intensity is going to be much higher than it was in February. So therefore you've sort of stacked, you've deprioritized and reprioritized strength and endurance on top of one another repeatedly, realistically within the context of a year, and then actually translated it onto the competition floor. However, if you came out in February and said, right, I'm now going to peak for a weightlifting meet, you need to devote a lot longer to be able to be in good shape to be able to do that because you're you're conflating the goals of the strength demands of Hyrox along with the running demands of Hyrox. So to then chuck something a bit more arbitrary along that spectrum means that you, you then need to be able to say, okay, well, in that case, there's some skill acquisition that needs done, there's some strength development that needs done, and if I'm going to keep up the running, then that's going to eat into my capacity for adaptation. So how do I look at these things? Whereas... Again, it's kind of going back to what we've said several times today, which is don't get drawn in by the shiny thing. Be tactical and resourceful about what you plan and prep for. And yeah, consistent goal setting along a spectrum of the interest in which you have. Because essentially I lift, swim, bike and run. So what components of that am I lacking in? What components of that am I strong in? And therefore, how can I align my goals with where my abilities currently lie? I think my abilities at the moment are probably a bit more strength dominant because I haven't been doing a huge amount of endurance volume. Um, because I haven't wanted to, to be honest, post double, no, no easier way to ruin triathlon for yourself than doing (laughs) one of those. And my strength stuff feels pretty good at the moment. I'm doing movement patterns. I haven't done for a while. I feel like my trunk is much more robust and I can create a lot more tightness than I could before. My front squats felt garbage a couple of weeks ago. Like my, my actual positioning with a hundred kilos in a front squat felt terrible. And I thought, Oh, my core strength has plummeted here, but essentially it was just positioning. I just felt a bit rough, groggy two weeks later, and I'm back to moving like I was before. So it's it, it's leaning into these these seasons, like we said in the previous episode, and knowing when to turn what dial up. But more importantly, you can't turn the dial from zero to 100. You might need to go 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 along the way, which is, again is a, is, a, is a metaphor we've borne out several times. But you're dead right that we need to be consistent in terms of planning what's next mm. because... Again, it, it's you can't just start swimming and swim 10k. But if you've been swimming for a year alongside other training, and then say, right, in six months' time I'm going to swim 10k, then it's much easier to start that transition and build your volume from there. So it's it's why putting things on hold in a hybrid setting is is probably something we argue against. But keeping the skill ticking over in the background, and some volume just stimulating you in the background is always very useful. Because it means you can basically give yourself a bit more of a range on the spectrum of strength and endurance, so you can be a bit more fluid with your goals as you go. But if you put all your eggs in one basket for a period of time, you need to be conscious that you can't then put them at the other end of the spectrum three months later, because you're going to have essentially reduced your ability at the other end. And I think um, I'm going to call it there, because I think I've said the same thing several different ways, but nonetheless, hopefully the point has been made. So anything to add there, Phil? No, just... I guess for the the goal setting one, if if you're okay with, you know, changing your goals and because you want to do loads of different things, you know, why not? Go for it. But be aware that does limit how far you can potentially go in one domain. And it, it sets you up for more success, more fulfillment, and more enjoyment essentially. Because surely you want to you want to achieve the goals you set out to achieve. 
So setting incremental goals along the way that are logically in line with your current ability and the sort of previous training phase you've done means that you're going to be ticking off more boxes as you go. But it does maybe mean that doing a powerlifting competition whilst training for bad water is probably <laughs> not something that's realistic to do to the best of your ability. But doing a powerlifting competition this year to the best of your ability and then devoting 18 months to train to bad water whilst keeping your strength work up before it drops down ahead of peaking is probably a more sensible way to do things. So essentially, patience is a virtue, ladies and gentlemen. You didn't need two white men on a podcast to tell you that, but we have. So welcome to welcome to the world we now live in, and thank you very much for listening. And we hope that that has been insightful as we cover the 10 things that we believe are the most common mistakes in this space, and we would encourage you to engage further in our academic educational setting, which is in the show notes down below where Phil is hosting lots of lectures on lots of things we've discussed today. Johnny and I are hosting seminars in more practical terms from a coaching and an athlete point of view. There is a research database and a chat room for our premium athletes. So I think that's probably it. Do all the podcasty stuff, please, and see you next time. See you later, everyone.